Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the second of two listening sessions for the Vermont Film and Media Task Force. I see a lot of familiar faces and also a lot of new names. So welcome to you all, whether you're joining us for the second time or for the first time to hear about the work of the task force. I'm Karen Middleman. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Arts Council. And we're the state arts agency, as many of you know, and also the state affiliate of one of the federal cultural agencies, the NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts. And as one of the lead funders of the arts in our state, we support film and media in a pretty wide variety of ways. Everything from direct grants to a filmmaker or videographer to create new work, to teaching residencies that bring film and media artists into the classroom to work with students in K through 12 classrooms. Um, and also support for cultural organizations like theaters and a host of other arts organizations that produce and distribute film for public audiences. So when we were asked whether the Vermont Arts Council would chair the Film and Media Task Force to examine ways that we might cultivate a more vibrant film ecosystem in our state, we immediately said yes. So I'm delighted to be here with all of you and looking forward to a productive and interesting conversation. I'd like to start us off before I turn things over to Heather Pelham, our moderator, by inviting two of our champions in the state legislature in Vermont to say a few words. We have with us Senator Randy Brock and Representative Stephanie Jerome, who have both been really strong advocates and champions for not just for film and media, but for the entire arts ecosystem and the creative sector across Vermont in the last legislative session. So we're really grateful to have them here and. Glad to have them in our corner. Um, Senator Brock, would you like to start us off? Sure, just, just very briefly, uh, uh, both Representative Jerome and, and myself separately uh, dealt with introducing some legislation uh, to take a look at uh, media in Vermont and to try to ask questions as to why so many movies that feature Vermont are made in Massachusetts or in British Columbia. Um, that, frankly, was an annoyance, and it also suggested to us there was a tremendous missed opportunity. And so we introduced bills separately in the two chambers that ultimately made themselves uh, a part of a single bill. And as the legislatures often do, it was a bill on economic development that started out as a bill against robocalls. And this got attached to it as one of many amendments and made it through the legislative session and it created this organization. The purpose of which was to say, what should we do as a state uh, to support the film industry and how should we go about doing it? And to do that, we created this particular task force to do a, 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 a bunch of examinations and queries and to talk to people like you who are involved in film and interested in film and uh, to, to come up with answers and then perhaps to propose some legislation to actually implement some solutions. So I'm glad that we, we got through this, this journey and we're now into the actual implementation phase. The last uh, talking session or, or review session that we had <clears throat> got many ideas out. And I know that there are many more people here in this session today. And I know I, for one, am, am absolutely looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Representative Jerome? Thank you, Senator. Um, so I, I am, my name is Stephanie Jerome and I represent the towns of Brandon, Pittsburgh and Sudbury on the Western side of the state. And I'm the ranking member on the House Commerce Committee. And um, as Senator Brock alluded to this uh, bill that we worked on S11 was a giant workforce development bill, but it had incorporated a, a significant piece of funding for the creative economy and also uh, the film commission study. And I think I mentioned that because it just shows the amount of support uh, within the legislature that the arts have. Um, and there's a wide recognition of how, how the importance of the arts in the economy of Vermont. Uh, so after listening during our last session, um, listening session, um, it became really apparent that there is this real strong need for a database of not only crew and workers, but equipment and facilities and venues and locations. And um, when I was reviewing the, the, the last meeting, it was really clear that, that you know, time and time that came again up as, as a real need for this industry. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what comes out of today's session. And um, 
seeing the uh, comments and um, insight that you have to offer. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And I'm delighted to turn things over to our facilitator, Heather Pelham, who's the commissioner of the Vermont Department of Tourism and Marketing and a wonderful partner to the Arts Council for many years. Take it away, Heather. Thank you, Karen, I appreciate that. Um, welcome again, really, really excited to have this continuation of this conversation. Um, as Karen mentioned, I am the commissioner of the Department of Tourism and Marketing for the state of Vermont. Um, been in that role for about three years. And as I mentioned last session, I previously held the role of chief marketing officer for the state. So between those two roles, I've spent a lot of time along with my team thinking about the Vermont brand and, and how best to promote the state, both in terms of visitation and for relocation. So um, I also mentioned that in the context of I work within the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. So along with my colleagues, every day we're thinking about economic development and how we can support our businesses, large and small, thrive here in Vermont, including the film and media sector. So um, I think we can co collectively agree on the benefits of a robust film industry and you know, not just in terms of jobs and economic impact, impact but also how it can support a strong brand for Vermont. Um, but exactly how we do that is why we are gathered here this afternoon. So um, as Representative Jerome mentioned, we were able to hear from a collection of film producers and professionals in our first listening session. And so today we're gonna to turn to a few other aspects of the film and media ecosystem. But before I do that, I do see that, that we have a hand up from the audience. So Christina, did you have a question that you needed to get off your chest before we start? I do not. I just wanted to be the first one to comment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we will have time for that. So I'll go over a little housekeeping then now, which is to say that we do have um, we do have four speakers with us today that um, we invited to share some different perspectives on our film and media eco ecosystem. Um, between them, we would will have time for a few questions, you know, hopefully directed specifically at the speaker who just spoke, and then more time at the end for more of a robust discussion. We have a couple of time constraints for some of our speakers, so just ask folks to respect that. Um, and if we don't get to your question immediately, we will certainly make time um, before the session is over and also feel free to use the chat feature as well. Um, so to start off, we, uh, as I mentioned, we've invited a few speakers um, to join us from other film offices here in the Northeast to share their perspective. Um, so I'd like to start by introducing Stephen Feinberg. Uh, Stephen is the executive director of the Rhode Island Film and Television Office, um, a screenwriter and director himself. Stephen has led the Rhode Island Film and Television Office since 2004 and is probably best known now for bringing Newport, Rhode Island to millions of viewers through the HBO series, The Gilded Age. Um, and I will say, Steve, Steve, I will say, Steve, and I read it in recent news report that you dreamed of making movies since you were eight years old um, and that you were able to make your living as a writer in Hollywood for more than 20 years. So congratulations, uh, welcome, and please um, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I want to also thank the senator, representative, everybody here. I'm pretty much going to uh, just freewheel it. Um, as Heather mentioned, I, I started making movies when I was eight years old. And one of the things I said at one point to my parents, they were talking about the movie, The Great Gatsby that was filming and we were on our way to Massachusetts on a Sunday. My mom had the paper on her lap as my dad was driving. And they're talking about The Great Gatsby filming in, in uh, Newport. And I remember looking out the window saying, oh, well, maybe one day I'll be in charge of all the movies of Rhode Island. And I was eight and I know exactly where I was. Um, it was Route 37 onto 95 and there used to be a Howard Johnson's mm. over there. So I always knew I, I was always making movies. I went out to Los Angeles, went to UCLA, USC, sold my first project at 20th Century Fox before I graduated and was one of the lucky guys. I, I worked with the studios. I traveled to Australia, Luxembourg, Canada. Um, and then uh, 2004, uh, someone had mentioned that there was the opportunity of a new revitalized Rhode Island film and TV office, and if I would apply, and there was a two-week window, and I, 
I did, and I, I was uh, chosen. And, and it was really um, try to maximize the potential of Rhode Island film. And what does that mean? That means bringing productions to Rhode Island uh, from Hollywood. And so that these productions would, let's say, water the ground um, of Rhode Islanders. And then find those people who are like me when I was eight years old or junior high school or high school or college. Um, we have a high concentration of, of uh, college and universities in Rhode Island, um, the creative economy. Can we, can we get those seeds to sprout? and go uh, hopefully to a national, international stage. So it was really uh, a multi-prong. Uh, that was my, my approach. And my predecessor didn't really see the idea of, of, of building up the local, but I thought that was very important. And what that means is not only as a writer, director, producer, but your crew base. So the very first thing I did, and we had no tax credit program whatsoever, but I knew that some of the projects that had drawn me around the world had a tax incentive. Uh, Australia had a tax incentive. Um, I went to New Brunswick to take a look because they had a tax incentive. Luxembourg had a tax incentive. Um, the only place that really had any kind of tax incentive in the United States at the time was Louisiana. Um, and I saw some holes in their, in their program. So, the first thing I did was bring the uh, the Showtime series Brotherhood to Rhode Island. It's a story about Rhode Island. It was a cautionary tale. It ended up uh, winning a Peabody Award. Um, and we went for three seasons and built our crew base. And that was 18, almost 19 years ago. We created an incentive program of which I had sleepless nights for six months of writing it from scratch and making sure that um, I'd take on the role of a evil producer and then take on the role of the state of Rhode Island to protect us because I love the state of Rhode Island more than any place in the world. So it was about creating that um, tax incentive. Um, the tax incentive has evolved over time. Uh, in the beginning, I had no cap whatsoever. Uh, we had a governor who was anti the, the idea of uh, incentivizing businesses, and then so a cap was put on. I had a $15 million annual cap of tax credits. That went, then I finally was able to rally it up to 20, 25, 30, and this year I've got it up to 40, and next year 40 million as well. We offer a 30% credit. Uh, what does that mean? Someone spends $100 million, they get a $30 million tax credit on the production spent on the ground in Rhode Island after our Division of Taxation does a very thorough audit. Uh, nothing that leaves the state of Rhode Island uh, is allowed. So in other words, if a, if, if a producer is opening up an office um, in Rhode Island and, and uh, one of their production assistants goes to Massachusetts, and goes to Ikea to buy the office furniture, it doesn't count. You have to get the furniture in Rhode Island. So that's really important because we want to make sure our vendors are taken care of. Um, I had a study done recently. Uh, you know, one of the things that folks talk about is return on investment. So uh, we had a study done, uh, industrial economics out of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, we had a series called Nosferatu for AMC. They did a very in-depth study and found out for every $1 we gave in a tax credit, returned $5.44 of economic activity. And that was just the production alone. So that's direct. So every $1 equals $5.44 of economic activity. That was the return on the investment. Out of the 39 cities and towns that we have in the state of Rhode Island, 37 of them were used. So that gave you a sense of that. But um, Heather mentioned, um, Heather mentioned like we have the Gilded Age right now that's filming uh, and they'll be wrapping tomorrow. Um, but we also had Hocus Pocus uh, too. Now Hocus Pocus too 
received in Rhode Island a tremendous amount of media coverage. I like to say, they say it's Salem, but we really know it's Rhode Island. And what has transpired of having people from all over the United States and frankly, some people from all over the world that would come and visit to try to capture some of the filming. And I don't know how many of you folks sometimes go on to YouTube um, and you put on YouTube and you can go into the rabbit hole, but suddenly I was finding all these people from around the world that would, had descended upon Rhode Island and were, were filming, you know, trying to capture whatever they could have Hocus Pocus too. Um, so that also brought a lot of um, uh, extra uh, media and um, uh, just additional eyes on the production that weren't necessarily the direct return on investment, but they were the indirect return. Um, you know, we've been in a ton of magazines. Uh, you know, when you when you hear Bette Midler say, I love the seafood of Rhode Island to the USA Today, that has an impact that is above and beyond uh, the actual production. So there are those ancillaries. The other thing to keep in mind is that with streaming services and with free TV and with DVD, Blu-ray, and, and, and less so with DVD and Blu-ray, those, um, those physical purchases aren't, uh, as, uh, aren't going to be as part of our future as, as streaming services, but these shows are in perpetuity. Uh, they're forever and they go across the globe. So oh, I should say this, I should have said this in the beginning. Vermont is a very, very, very beautiful place. But I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't invite the entire state of Vermont to come to Rhode Island. So we want to move you guys to Rhode Island if we could, but I know we can't do that. But you have a very beautiful state. Um, I will tell you that your locations are spectacular. You're not incredibly large. You've got some diversity uh, that's a wonderful for creativity. I always tell people in Rhode Island, we're only 48 miles long and 40 miles wide. Uh, rush hour traffic lasts five minutes. And you could go you know, from a cityscape to the woods, to a beachfront, to a mansion all in about 15 minutes and time is money. I think you folks have uh, some of those advantages as well, which you should take, which you should take advantage of. Um, the workload. Let me talk about the workload. My office when I started was just me. Um, I had to write the incentive program, of which other states have copied, and maybe some made stronger, some might have made weaker. I finally was able to get an assistant. I had a volunteer for about a year, but I got an assistant. After that, I got another assistant. I built the website from scratch. So if you jump down to the www.film.ri.gov, www.film.ri.gov, you'll see I made a, uh, a video, a promotional video. You'll see locations, you'll see everything. It's comprehensive. It was from scratch. So I was able to then get a webmaster to help me do the uh, nuts and bolts of what I needed creatively. Uh, creatively talking about location photos, talking about the things that um, I think Heather, you had mentioned or perhaps a representative uh, or, or the Senator had brought up, but we, we created um, all the forms. I created a, I, I created a um, permit system, a free permit system. Why did I do that? And that free permit system has nothing to do with tax incentives. But when I was in Los Angeles and I had read and wrote about Rhode Island, one of the things we have Rhode Island School of Design, we had a student that was making a little movie and they had rented out a pharmacy uh, at nighttime and they were doing a fake holdup, a movie holdup. Well, the folks, some, some witnesses had no idea that it was a movie being shot. And the Providence police came, swarmed the pharmacy at night, guns drawn, 
and ready to shoot these students who are making a movie. And I said, that cannot happen on my watch, knock on wood in my 19 years, it hasn't. And so what we do is we encourage, we can't handcuff people to do it, but we encourage, and the word's gone around town, that you have to um, fill out the permits for the state of Rhode Island film and TV office. We work with about four cities and towns that are the larger ones that also have duplicated it, which I prefer there's no duplication, but they wanted it. But every city and town, we make sure that if there's any quote unquote gunplay, every city and town um, police department knows about it. Anything that might be fiery, anything, we let the fire department know. We usually, we let the town managers know. It's, it's incumbent on us to let the community know that there is something that might be out of the ordinary. That is to create safety for the community, for the filmmakers, and it also, my dad being a sixth grade teacher, um, helps to educate the filmmaker of being a responsible filmmaker, doing the right thing, and leaving a location in the same condition or better uh, than they found it. So those are things where, you know, taking on that position of being an educator, um, a leader, but at the same point, um, safety. Um, and we do those free permits and that's my assistant, Carol's really great at that. Carol's been with me for 18 years. Um, we do that for the commercials. We do that for uh, student films, independent films and the large films. What we also do is we get their, their budgets. So we capture how much money is being spent in Rhode Island that is not necessarily utilizing the Motion Picture Tax Incentive Program. So we're capturing that. So we found out that millions of dollars that we have been able to um, uh, qualify just, just so we have that knowledge. And we might get like 40, 50 permits a year that are not necessarily using the larger tax incentive programs. I'm um, trying to think what else. We've also, uh, next week as an example, um, we've got the Gilded Age. Uh, I've got location managers doing, um, we'd like to do in person, but right now we're doing Zoom with the different colleges and universities. I moderate um, a Q&A with these, uh, before it was the production designer and prop master and costumes for the Gilded Age. And we share that um, with college and university students that have media programs. So we're trying to do, I'm trying to do everything that's very comprehensive. Again, it's now it's three people in my office. We hope to expand it to two more um, because we have a lot of eyes on what we do. And I say we do the work of 12 people but it's, it's been a pretty small group that's made this happen. And sometimes I, you know, I get paid for 35 hours, but I find myself often working 60, 70 hours a week. Um, but it's, you know, it's who I am and what I love to do. And the head of HBO can call me on a Sunday, like he did this past Sunday at noon and say, I know you're working. <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, you build those those foundations and those relationships. But I will tell you, um, and I want you to know, and I say this from the bottom of my heart, if you guys need help, I can help you um, as a filmmaker. I can help you as a film commissioner who's been doing it for 19 years. Um, I can help you build your program if you um, need someone to be a consultant or a mentor, non-paid, just someone who could be a support, support you. Um, I'm happy to do that. And uh, I guess I covered some ground for you. <laughs> thank you, Stephen. That's, first of all, thank you for that offer of free consultancy. Um, you know, we'd love to take you up on that. Um, I see Senator Brock has a question um, and I, I know your time is limited. So go ahead, Senator. 
You're, hopefully it's a, a, a quick question. I'm wondering about funding um, in the actual funding of your office for your day-to-day -day operations. Is it entirely state funded or were you yes. able to get any COVID funding, for example, from the federal government? No, we are, we are um, I'm glad you asked that. Thank you for asking that. We are um, state funded. Um, it is, I am under the Council on the Arts um, where I started. Uh, uh, let me, let me backtrack. At one point before I started, so maybe in 1990s, early 2000s, the film office was under what we had was the Rhode Island Economic Development Corporation, uh, the EDC. Um, apparently, according to the executive director of the EDC at the time, his name was Mike McMahon, uh, said to my predecessor, there's not been a lot of films going on. What are your plans? And apparently the answer that he received wasn't good enough and decided he was going to uh, dissolve the film and TV office. And that was the plan. Randy Rosenbaum, who was the executive director of the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts, said, you know, this film office, I think, has some significance, some importance. Let me legislatively have it brought up under the umbrella of the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts, which he did. So, so the film office then was under the Council on the Arts. The budget, I can tell you, was very small at the time. Uh, I took a quite a pay cut leaving Los Angeles with my 52 boxes. Um, I think my total budget was about $55,000, which included my salary. Um, but I said to myself, in six months, I'll know if I made a terrible mistake and we'll go back to Los Angeles, or if I'm going to stay home here in Rhode Island, um, they'll, they'll know. Uh, my office is, I make six figures, over, just so you know, so we've We've climbed the ladder there. Um, I have an assistant who's making uh, about sixty thousand uh, dollars. Another, the the webmaster is making about fifty, and uh, we have about, I think, about sixty thousand dollars, maybe fifty thousand dollars of operating expenditures, of which I use for sponsorships and and other things that we do. Um, some program. Uh, the Council on the Arts has grants and, and, and that's a sep, you know, somewhat separate. Um, but I'm fully funded by, by the state. I've had to speak. Uh, thankfully, I've developed outstanding relationships with the Speaker of the House, the Senate President, the governors over time as they, they you know, sometimes have moved on for whatever reason. But they, I advocate for what we do. They have always been very supportive. Um, I think it was Senator Pell once who said there's both uh, a digestive period. I forgot exactly how he said it, but another senator said, um, you want to be at the table because if you're not at the table, you're often on the menu. So <laughs> I, I like to be at the table and um, we advocate for what we do. And uh, I hope that I've answered your question. But the other thing I will say to you, I will say to you, it's really important. There's been times that we've had governors that have tried to bring the film office under back under the fold of the Economic Development Corporation. I've really fought against that. Uh, the reason I have fought against that is because um, when you do that often, it becomes sometimes a political position which isn't in the best interest of the constituents. Um, you know, you don't want to have someone who is the head of the Vermont film office who doesn't really know what they're doing and have that film experience. So I think the idea that I've been here for 19 years, coming up to 19 years, provides a stability. And frankly, uh, I'm not trying to blow my own horn or to my own horn, but I don't think there's anyone in the state of Rhode Island knows more about Rhode Island film than me. So 
Um, I'm just, you know, being solid about that. Um, and, and, and what that means, it's multifaceted. There's the political side of it. There's the practical side of it. It's the educational side of it. And there's the future and, and economic development and all these things, but it's multifaceted and you have to wear a variety of hats and, and hopefully be an outstanding leader and be empathetic to other people. And, and, and hopefully um, the thing I have seen that has been very, very comforting is to see these people who have opportunities that I never had. I had to go out to Los Angeles, but you're seeing kids that are working on these films. This girl came up to me for Hocus Pocus 2, I'm gonna, and then I'll stop talking. This girl came up to me with her parents when we had the screening of Hocus Pocus 2, and she said, and she went to Emerson. She's from Rhode Island. She said, I want you to know I wrote you a letter uh, several months ago um, about what my dreams were, and you forwarded that letter to the producers, and I worked on Hocus Pocus 2 for a year, and now I'm working on this other production, and I just want to thank you so much, and her parents were there too, and it meant so much, and then the next day she wrote me a beautiful letter, um, but I said, you're the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing, so she's a perfect story, and you've got folks in Vermont, young people uh, who, if, if they love Vermont, to give them a place to work and to live and to play in a place they love, that that's, I think is, is wonderful. And I think that's what we're, we're trying to achieve here. So um, do you have time for a question from Representative Jerome? I, I um, do. I, I'm taking my mom to see, I, my mom's 86, and I'm taking her to see the Glenn Miller Band at one of our theaters, uh, but we, we have some time. I've got about another 10 minutes. Just a quick question for clar clarification. What is your, what is the budget for your office? You know, that's a good question. I'm going to say it's about, I, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but I'm going to say it's about 300 to 350. 350. Okay. That's, oh, that's interesting. Okay. And then you would, you would, from, from my understanding of what you're saying, the location of where your film office is located, the equivalent would be Vermont Arts Council in Vermont. So you're saying that that's the appropriate spot for it to be. Um, yeah, at. because well, I think what's great about having it there, I'll give you an example. We have um, in the Arts Council, we have um, one of our, our folks does arts and education. So one of the things I created about a dozen years ago is a program called the Give Me Five program for high school students. And the idea of Give Me Five, um, we have north, let's say, Winsocket to southwesterly. I said, well, I want to get these kids to make, you can only give me five with someone else, right? So you, you have to form a collaboration. So we do these five minute short films um, and we create these labs and all. Uh, and I did that with the education, uh, arts and education person for the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts. So we created this program, create a rubric, it's all brand new, and we've done it for 12 years. And so that one little lab became four labs because there was a demand. And then we had a, a screening for parents and family members and, and friends at one of our local theaters. So that was something that was important to me that, and I'll give you a brief example. We had one of the students who made a film about poverty and they were doing very, their, their five minute documentary was very data driven, very um, uh, widescreen. Then we had another student, same, same exact time frame, talking about poverty and, and homelessness and all. And they made a film that was very microscopic on the street. So if you put them together, they would have been very comprehensive, but they were able to see each other's work. So they were able to get another point of view. And that was something that was important to me to be able to build a community so they could say, hey, we met at the Give Me Five lab. And then I saw your film and you saw my film. And these kids are in high school. And what I'm hoping is, when they become 30 years old 
and they're working on their feature films, uh, documentaries or narratives that they will say, yeah, we met at Give Me Five and, and you kind of change how I look at life or making movies. So that's where an example of the Arts Council mm -hmm. working in tandem can be very the Relationships, helpful. yeah. Yes, and, and I still work with, you know, the DBR, Department of Business Revenue. I work with the Commerce Corporation. I might call up the Commerce Corporation and say, hey, I'm looking for, uh, I'm looking for some warehouse space, 25,000 square feet. I'm looking for 40 foot ceiling. Do you have anything in your database? So we, we, we still, the phone calls are still made. We still get together. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Yep. One more quick question, Stephen, um, and then we're going to move on to our next speaker. So we have time for everybody. Um, you did. You mentioned, you know, the first production you did was about, I'll say, building capacity, getting the crew in place. You know, that was 19 years ago. Now you're at a 40 million dollar budget with a five to one return on investment. Can you give us a, a, a somewhat brief answer in terms of like how long did it take for you to be able to? produce a, ret a positive return on investment. I don't know if you did other studies throughout the years, but thinking if we're starting where we start from, how long well, is we, it gonna take before we're able to really make that return on investment? Yeah, well, I will tell you, we had one study done by a Dr. Ed Maisie early on that I think he found it was like $6. It was maybe like 622 return on his investment. Then you get some other folks that, you know, they don't wanna take all the information in and they wanna back up and to something, um, but on our last study, we were very comprehensive with everything. And as I said, um, that was- I'm just saying at the very beginning though, like what does it take when maybe you don't have all the crew in place? You know, we heard in our last session that, you know, a lot of our production folks may have other jobs because there isn't as strong an ecosystem here just yet. So maybe everybody well, isn't, uh, look, right, you know, so just wondering that, the timeline me, to build up that critical mass. Right, let me give you an example. So the first thing I got was this, the Brotherhood series, or it was a pilot. It was a pilot at the time. And we didn't have a tax incentive in place. So I went to the governor, speaker, Senate president, head of commerce or EDC at the time. And I saw that they were spending $4.5 million for this pilot. Um, that was going to have three days in Rhode Island. The rest was going to be up in Toronto. They're going to spend $4.5 million. I said to the producer who had also done the Sopranos, I said, Henry, how much are you saving by going up to Toronto? By the way, they had already ha opened up their offices. Um, he said it was about a half a million dollars to do it up in Toronto. I said, if we got you 300,000. Do you think I could have an argument with the chairman of Showtime? Steve, don't even bother. But I, I saw it as an opportunity and we we did get 300,000. If they spent $4.5 million, they were going to get $300,000 back. And then if the series got picked up, they would film it in Rhode Island. So we did that. We won. It was a successful show. And yes, we built up a crew base that was exhausted after season one. And then season two, then season three, and we more and more. So we did Underdog at the same time was going on with Walt Disney we, as we did The Brotherhood. What happened was people started to move back to Rhode Island uh, from Los Angeles, from New York. You will find, you will get people that, come on, man, you guys are beautiful. You're Vermont. You know, you're 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 not some lousy uh, place. You're Vermont, so you're going to get people moving and buying homes in Vermont or renting apartments in Vermont, and to have a wonderful quality of life there and balance. Um, so they're going to move, and you're going to get that return on investment because, you know, if you have your auditors do the right work, um, you're only getting a credit based on what is spent on the ground. It's almost like a coupon. So, you know, I tell people, it's like, you're gonna spend $10 million and you're gonna get a $3 million credit, but that's all been fully audited and it was money spent on the ground in Vermont. It's a good thing, but you're gonna encourage infrastructure, new businesses to come in to support that. 
and you but the, the key is you have to be steady you have to you have to not look like oh we're gonna have the program we're not gonna have the program you know it's all predictability and anyone who invests wants a return on their investment so um okay that's really helpful um i am i know that you need to go and i know we have a bunch of other speakers we've got questions as well so i'm gonna I'm going to leave it there and say thank you very much, Stephen. Yeah, we really I'm appreciate it. I'm happy to come here. back in the. I'm happy to come back in the future. Also, if you if you need me. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I know we have some questions, but I want to also at this point um, here we have another perspective from another uh, locality in terms of representing a film office. That I think would be important to hear from next. So we have with us today Tim Clark. Uh, Tim Clark has been the Buffalo Niagara Film Commissioner for over 16 years, and he is also the former chair of the Association of Film Commissioners International, which represents over 300 film offices on six continents. In that role, he worked closely with movie studio executives, screen sector professionals, and colleagues from around the world to develop global policy use in the making of motion pictures, including COVID protocol policies on film sets. And he also has government experience serving as a senior advisor for two county executives and as the Western New York regional representative for the late um, New York State Governor Mario Cuomo prior to his appointment as film commissioner. So, you know, we're talking about film offices in general, what it would take for Vermont to reestablish one. So, Tim, I'm wondering if you can maybe pick up on some of Stephen's comments, share your perspective, having worked with many different localities as they, they try to tackle what we're, what we're talking about today. Absolutely, Commissioner. I'd uh, love to do that, and I'd love to see Vermont, uh, you know, be uh, uh, a competitor of ours. But I don't look at it that way. I think, you know, the rising uh, tide will bring everybody up. And so, uh, you know, what we're seeing um, globally, really, and as I, as you pointed out, I was, uh, I just, uh, uh, you know, I'm the recent uh, chair of the Association of Film Commissioners International. When I talk to my colleagues around the world, what I absolutely see is the demand for content, right? Because we all saw it during the uh, COVID uh, lockdowns and, you know, staying at home and watching endless hours of uh, uh, streaming services and so forth. So there's a, there's a lot of platforms out there. There's a lot of uh, uh, streamers out there and the, even the big major studios uh that we're always into like theatrical releases they're always now they're you know they're very uh focused now on episodic television uh which used to be kind of movies but they're moving in that direction um now i represent a small portion of new york state uh the buffalo and niagara falls region so i'm not i don't work for the state and i'm one of uh, several regional offices uh throughout new york state um, and we deal very often with the New York State uh, Governor's Office for Motion Picture and Television Development. They're not headquartered in Albany, our state capital. Instead, they're headquartered in New York City where all the action happens uh, as far as filming goes, most of the action, I should say. But what we've seen uh, when we introduced the um, incentive in, um, uh, in New York is just this explosion of, uh, of, of you know, production happening not just in the city of New York, but also in areas like Buffalo, areas like Syracuse, New York. Uh, difficult to get to. It's not, you know, a direct flight from too many places, but I will say that they are seeing, you know, a, a lot of growth there. And when I say explosion of, you know, production growth, that means real jobs. And one thing I would disagree with Stephen on is that I, I think it's essential, really is, to have um, if it's a state agency or a state, you know, film commission, or state film office, whatever you want to call it, if they're if they're about marketing uh, the state and getting, you know, producers and and studios to take a look at filming in Vermont, they really should be cited in in um, in the realm of economic development because you cannot imagine. Well, you can imagine, and I'll even tell you. I mean, I've gone from. Um, zero projects here, really, in many of the years that this uh, film office started to, you know, we're bringing in d as direct spend. This isn't the economic, the economic spinoff that, you know, a lot of people talk about. 
Uh, but in direct spend, you know, we're north of $80 million in just our little region. Um, in New York City, for instance, we had 64 episodic television shows, um, as well as other movies and so forth, the last summer shooting in the city. So it means real jobs, and these people, you know, are all making very good money, very solid money. It brings in, and we're seeing it in Buffalo here, uh, brings in new businesses. We have uh, new uh, sound stages going up like crazy. We have uh, camera companies moving here. Uh, we just had one from Philadelphia come here, a big movie camera company, uh, expendable companies and so forth. They're all, you know, um, uh, beginning business here. And again, all of these people, you know, need some sort of guidance from the economic development experts, um, you know, that, and we always send them to the state because they're cited in Empire State Development, um, you know, uh, our EDC for, for our state. And I will say that um, most of the studios are very, um, studios and most of the producers, I would say, to the independent uh, producers as well, are very interested in helping the economy. And it's very important. I, I recently had um, Paramount Pictures. They've been here a number of times already. But, you know, their, produ their president of physical production was here. And uh, he made sure that when they were buying lumber, for instance, uh, to build sets, they weren't going to Home Depot or Lowe's. They weren't going to the big box places. They were going to the individual lumber yards here. They were going to pay a little bit more, they thought, but it was important to them to leave the money back into the community in which they're, you know, which they claim they're disrupting. Uh, I look at it much differently. They're not disrupting it at all. They're uh, enhancing it and bringing new dollars. And these aren't these aren't Buffalo dollars uh, recirculated, or in your case, Vermont dollars recirculated. You know, we have a lot of these tax credits like the, um, you know, historical stuff or whatever, which entices developers to spend their money and, you know, get money from the state and so forth. The money that's spent by Hollywood is coming from Hollywood or coming from, you know, sadly China in a lot of cases, uh, but also other parts of the world. That's new revenue, new money. It's not being recirculated. It's coming into your state. And it's exciting. It's great. It's putting people to work. It's um, it's a sexy business, you know, when you see movie stars w wandering around your your uh, restaurants and, and uh, through your communities. Um, you know, it, it, people get excited for that. Uh, we had Bradley Cooper here not too long ago. And, um, uh you know, uh, Emily Blunt and uh, John Krasinski running around here. And, you know, people were excited about it. And it just brings a real uh, sense of um, uh, pride, I think, to our community. And I think it brings would bring very much uh, uh, an ideal of pride, you know, to your state as well. And I, I just see, you know, the business has evolved uh, in Buffalo, um, very similar, I think, to the way you could predict it to be in Vermont. You know, you start kind of slow, um, and you, before you know it, you know, you're, you're, you're seeing tens of millions of dollars just being poured into the community. And again, that, that means, you know, um, jobs, and it means new vendors, and it means people moving, as Stephen pointed out, to, uh, to your community. I have people, Teamsters from New York, who bought houses here in Buffalo. They don't live here, but they're here enough where they, they, they're up here paying taxes, and, uh, and they like it here. And they bring their families here uh, uh, when they're shooting and, um, you know, spend the summers here, and uh, they get to, you know, play on Lake Erie and Lake Ontario and see Niagara Falls and all of the things that we have here, are the assets that we have. I think also Vermont um, has a treasure, treasure trove of um, you know architectural assets that would really you know uh, make people want to come there. I also think that, and this is kind of that bad part of all of this, is to be in the game you have to provide some sort of incentive. And it wasn't until we provided an incentive that that we were you know on the map, as they say. So with all of that, you know, I I think that you're thinking very smartly. And I think in the end, uh, I'm uh, very envious of your public officials, especially those who are on this call today, because I see in them, you know, some real progressive thought process about the future of the economy in Vermont. 
It's sexy for sure. It's creative people running around for sure. But bottom line, it's the economic development um, uh, that you, you'll really be shocked at and surprised at. Um, and to drive Senator Brock just a little crazier, I want you to know that three years ago we shot a movie here, a Christmas movie, a holiday theme movie called Christmas in Vermont. And none of it was shot in Vermont. And I feel your pain, Senator, because I will tell you, for many years, before we had the incentive, before we had, you know, the 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 sort of the atmosphere for uh, film friendly mil filmmaking up here, uh, I was watching uh, movies that were set in Buffalo, but being shot in Winnipeg, Manitoba, you know, being shot just over the border from here in Toronto uh and uh and in other places sadly it still happens you know and you're not going to get them all i have a movie uh coming in a studio film it's a mark Wahlberg movie um but they're not shooting here they're shooting um second unit photography so they're coming in basically they're going to shoot a minivan driving around uh, uh western new york here from a helicopter and then from the ground and uh, but they're shooting it all in atlanta because of course the incentives in atlanta are crazy it's almost too much, so you got to be careful. You know, you don't want to. You want to be fair to your taxpayers and your, and the people who uh, you represent. But you also, uh, you know, think you need to be competitive. And because of uh, Stevens' numbers, and I have similar numbers. You know, for every dollar spent, you know, you get a, a really ROI, a really nice ROI. And I think it's uh, probably the best uh, of any. Uh, in uh, New York State of any of the other programs. So with that, I'll kind of leave it alone. And, and I know some of this is, uh, um, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll have some questions. Uh, a lot of this was anecdotal, but uh, but there really is uh, quite a, a, a great um, economic benefit to, to your state. I, yeah, I wonder if we could start with, you know, I think everyone on this call probably is right there with you in, in being champions of what this could do for us. But just because you have had so much experience with other film commissions, can you talk sure. a little bit about where they have fallen down, either film commissions who have folded or, you know, if they've decided that they politically or otherwise cannot offer incentives, you know, what are the pitfalls that we should be looking out for? Well, the pitfalls, in fact, are, um, uh, well, everything, and I, ha you know, I, I do a lot of television interviews locally here and, and some of the trade magazines, uh, uh, you know, and, and all these articles, people ask me, you know, what is it that brings people to Buffalo or Niagara Falls or whatever? Yeah, okay, great. It's, uh, you know, Niagara Falls for sure is, uh, you know, has a global brand. You know, I I've traveled the world and I have yet to run into anybody anywhere that doesn't at least know the, what Niagara Falls is. But, you know, they're still not going to come here and shoot if they're not going to get, if they're not going to have a competitive edge in getting some money back. And, um, and that has truly worked for us here. And where I've seen it fail uh, are in states that uh, have a zero incentive uh, or, you know, everybody wants something for free you know i mean i hate to say it but but there's a price for free right and um and and it's and although it's seemingly giving something to these producers they're giving something much more valuable back to the to the uh community and the, and and really i think that that has to be um forefront in your decision making and that's you know, I think those who don't have that, that's where I see a lot of pitfalls because they, you know, the idea of build it and they will come or we have nice architecture or we have this great thing here. Believe me, I've, I, I lived it because I, in Buffalo here, was a bypass many years. Meanwhile, watching stuff, you know, being set in Buffalo, but it, you know, having lived here and living here all my life, you know, I see that it, that it wasn't shot here. Thank you. And I, I do want to get some uh, questions and comments from our audience. So Christina, go ahead. You've had your hand up first. So <laughs> I did. I didn't want anybody to miss my hand. Hi, everybody. Um, I am Christina Kumka. I am a career and tech ed teacher. And I see some of my colleagues on this call as well. I teach video communications. And in my program, kids go out into the community they film quality commercials for businesses largely for free, or those businesses have grants that they send to my school and I give 
kids money to create. And I know a lot of the teachers here that are in career and tech ed are trying to do the same thing. So hi, Mr. Clark, I'm so happy that you're on this call as well as Mr. Feinberg. And I just want to address um, sustainability. I know that I took uh, an informal survey of my students today, and they all agreed that if the jobs in film were in Vermont, they would stay in Vermont. So what I'm asking, I guess, is how do you perceive or how have you worked through sustaining the film industry in Vermont? And I mean, I'm sorry, in New York, because I feel like if my kids had jobs in the film industry in Vermont, they would stay in Vermont and they would add to the economy. Yeah, Christina, great question and great observations. Uh, and it has worked here very nicely. Uh, I can tell you that there are young kids that I've seen, um, you know, and they get they get on these movies as like a production assistant or, you know, very entry level position. Um, and, and, you know, that's the other reason why I keep pushing the economic side to this is because workforce development is such a huge part of what I do. And because we're growing, you know, all the time and we, so when a, when a movie comes in, they need your students, they need those people and they need, uh, them to, uh, have practice. They, and I love to hear that they're doing commercial work and things like that. I mean, any time spent on anything like that is never, ever wasted. And uh, it gives them an opportunity to learn maybe about lighting, about personalities. You know, the different people are, you know, some people are real idiots. Some people are super nice. Uh, it, uh, it teaches them so many great uh, life lessons. And I'm very proud to say that I've seen some um, kids, you know, maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago even, I've been doing this 16 years, hard to believe, but at the beginning of my career, I saw a lot of these um, uh, kids, and, and I always... <laughs> I remember the, there was a movie, it was like the gang who couldn't shoot straight. You know, these guys were just trying hard and the, ga the guys and the girls that were on that film were were, were working and they had patient uh, producers and, and who really showed them the ropes. These are the people who are now making six figures, you know, as a grip or a gaffer or, or whatever in, um, in these uh, bigger giant movies and watching, you know, coming to the, to the screenings and at the end of the movie watching their names roll through the credits. It's exciting to see and I do believe, and again, I saw, you know, the out-migration of our workforce here uh, um, all, all too well back in the early days of this thing. And now what I'm seeing are, and what I'm, and really I, it, it progressed, I heard a lot about it in COVID. I was getting calls at the office from people who had, who had grown up here, wanted to be in the movie industry or the television industry, and then ended up in Hollywood or, you know, Los Angeles or New York or wherever. And uh, they're able to move back here and um, take care of their aging parents, take, you know, be with their f uh, friends and family and sort of come back to a place that they grew up, a place that they love. And I think that those were very, you know, those are, you know, these are the anecdotal stories. Uh, but again, I keep coming back to the science of it all and the, the, the economic numbers. These kids can make a living in Vermont if you do what we did here in Buffalo. And I'm telling you, it's not that, um, like, it's a leap of faith. It absolutely is. And if you uh, had told me 10 years ago, even 11, 12 years ago, that we would be seeing, you know, giant movies with giant trucks and big, you know, stars coming through Buffalo uh, on a routine basis, I, I, I even think you were crazy. And I'm responsible for doing that right i just didn't think it was possible and now it's 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 unbelievable and we get calls literally every day now listen at the very beginning of this uh you know journey uh, we were getting i was our office was responsible for uh and still is for television shows things like that so we'd get the food network coming through uh, you know, the chicken wing was born in Buffalo, right? So that was always the big uh, thing. And they were going to restaurants to do that. And, and that was the production. And those kids worked on those kinds of productions. But in the end now, you know, it's grown in, in, uh, in budget size and in sort of prominence as well. And they Thank can. And I promise you that they will. Uh, you do a sustainable, uh, you know, 
uh, business plan. And that includes incentives, it includes workforce development. Those kids are going to graduate from your class and you'll be happy to say that you'll run into them at the supermarket and uh, you know, and, and around town because they'll be working on these movies. Thank you, Tim. And that's actually a great uh, transition. And I promise those folks who have their hands up, we will definitely get to, to your comments. But we have one other speaker with us who also has a time constraint. Um, and she can speak to some of these same issues that we're kind of talking about here in terms of um, the intersection here with education and workforce. So I would like to introduce a doc Dr. Vandora Williams. Um, Dr. Williams is a multiple Emmy award-winning documentary filmmaker who is a professor and assistant dean of administration in the division of communication and creative media at Champlain College. She primarily teaches in the broadcast media production program but also leads the new game sound design major at the college um, and during her time off she currently is in the research phase of another documentary on some lesser known civil rights heroines in the south. So Dr. Welling Dr. Williams welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Um, <laughs> hi, everyone. Um, well, thanks to the Vermont Arts Council for inviting me to join in on this discussion. And I thank the state legislators who are on the Vermont Film and Media Task Force. And I will, will keep my comments short because I would love to hear some of these uh, questions um, as well. Um, so I believe that bringing practical experience into the classroom is key to preparing students for the industry. And at Sham Champlain College, that is one of our core goals. And Champlain is known for its filmmaking, uh, broadcasting game studio majors, and many of our uh, student work has been recognized nationally through um, like the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences chapter, local and national film festivals, and statewide networks. So um, at the college, we endeavor to be aware of the current trends in the industry, and one trend um, that we are seeing is the converging technologies of um, that that affects the filmmaking, broadcast, and game studio majors, which I think is very uh, something that we should talk about for for this task force. And uh, we are addressing it by introducing uh, majors that new majors that address this. So the industry is integrating film and broadcast technology along with gaming software. To create, to create these popular films such as The Mandalorian, Ready Player One, HBO's Westworld, The Bat Batman, I could go on. So along with the traditional methods of production, we're training our students to combine gaming technology, virtual sets, and virtual production in their work. So we're currently working on, as I said, new majors that, that will include this convergence. And part of our goal is to create these opportunities for our students to work with industry professionals using this technology. And for most of our students, they try to get this experience outside of, of Vermont. And uh, this is where uh, the Film and Media Commission can be a great resource for higher education. We would love to have a central place to go to, to learn of industry professionals who are here in Vermont, but also productions that are coming to Vermont. We often get requests from production companies to have our students work as production assistants, and we would like more of that uh, to happen. Our students are looking for internships, and again, this would be a a great resource for our current and graduates to use for employment. And let me say a little bit about our graduates, just to give you a little data about what they are doing once they graduate from these programs. In 2019, our graduates from the game studio, filmmaking, broadcast uh, majors were able to get employment in California, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Colorado, North Carolina, and uh, Quebec, and some remained in Vermont. In 2020 and 2021, there was an increase of our graduates going to California, Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, and Quebec for work. And we saw um, less students staying in Vermont. And some of the reasons um, our graduates left the state was the lack of opportunity and the lack of housing. They're going to the hubs where they can thrive. And I have noticed um, a trend now of more Southern states like North Carolina, Texas, and South Carolina, and Florida becoming a draw for, for our graduates. So with the Film and Media Commission, 
that would be a great help for our students and for higher education uh, institutions like mine to connect with industry professionals and quite possibly um, have sustainable um, employment. So I just wanted to sort of put that out there. I promised I would be, I would be short and I surprised myself. I did a <laughs> news package in, <laughs> in talking about um, Champlain College and um, what we would like to see. I think it would be so um, incredibly helpful um, for to grow our our student um, base, but also um, for production companies to come in and to share that um, that workforce, right, and and that training uh, possibilities. And I think the technology with the converging, I think Vermont will be an excellent place to have those resources in place, so that we can grow from inside and also bring uh, work from outside. Uh, production companies outside to use our facilities and also shoot in the state. So with that, I will, that was quick. Yeah, well said. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Williams. Sure. Um, we have had some folks who have been very patient. So Gregory, go ahead. Did you have a, a question or a comment? Uh, you know, just first of all, thanks a lot for all of this great just data and, and experience and coming in and people taking their time to do this. It's really great. Um, Ms. Williams, I just want to say graduate of 88 from Champlain. So yay. <laughs> awesome to see you here. Um, my background is, is uh, always been a freelancer. Um, I've been a freelancer since uh, before I got out of high school in 84. Um, storyboard artist, uh, design, whatever I could get my hands on. And uh, also went to Burlington College for a two-year program in film, and a lot of my friends are pro uh, videographers, filmmakers, whatever. Um, so this subject has been sort of uh, really on my mind because now I'm making a transition from doing comics, graphic novel, illustration work. Uh, I want to get back into film, and so it's very fortuitous that this is happening. I just want to support, um, as a person who might be on the receiving end of any benefits of this program, and just say thank you very much for doing it. Um, I don't know if it's a question per se, but just you know whatever can be done at the Capitol, uh, at Montpelier, to incentivize and actually get across the line something which has been difficult in past film organizations in the state, uh, which is tax incentives whatever can be done to do that. I hope that this is the period of time where it is friendly as a concept at the Capitol, because I have heard from one degree of separation, even lawmakers who are hostile to the idea. And it just seems to be highly unrealistic in terms of having a future. Uh, we can talk about a lot of things that are helpful to filmmakers on the small end uh, and helpful to Vermont to be you know, integrate to the bigger film industry on the larger end. But ultimately, I think what has already been said by people very, very experienced in this area, um, and I just hope that there's a way to make that understood, is that we need to have tax incentives. It just it has to happen. And as a person on the very, very smallest end of all of this, I hear that all the time from professional friends who are, you know, 10 years in the business, but just like struggling here in Vermont or whatever. Um, it just you know, everybody's been waiting for this to happen for a long time. So I hope that this is the moment where everybody can kind of be in sync and sort of galvanize on that issue and really get it across the line. Um, I can't help. I'm on the tiny end of things, but I will say, you know, from my end, I hope it happens. And, you know, I'm really glad that this is happening and, and I hope this be around with more of this kind of energy. Um, you know, one thing that I would just like to see, even before all that tremendous amount of work and time that's involved in getting tax incentives across the line, is even if there's just one person with a desk and a telephone and a website, so that if anybody even conceives of doing production from out of state, that person can line them up with film professionals, you know, uh, the actors, uh, residency for productions that have to come through where where am i going to put all these people up 
food, et cetera. Like there's so many components to TV, film, et cetera, production. And, you know, it seems to me that part of the seriousness or taking serious of this in the future is even going to be paying for somebody to sit there with a desk and a phone and a web, and, you know, web access and be able to relay that information when people call. That's another thing. I, cause I asked some of my friends, Hey, I'm going to be in this thing. Is there anything I can ask? And they were like, well, those are two things. <laughs> so the only thing I got out of my film friends, um, and they're not that numerous, but there's five people. They all work full time in various different ways with film, film and video. And the two things I just got to repeat every time was when are we going to get the tax incentives? And when is there a film, a not a film board per se, but like an office for film that says, oh yeah, you need uh, you need sound operators. Boom. This is the per you know these are people and the and do, you know interface between those people who can do those jobs here and whatever production is intending to at least you know fact find if it's worth it for them to come through or not. So, and I'll uh, my uh, turn. Thank you, Gregory. Appreciate that. Um, Senator Brock, did you want to jump in here? Just a, just a quick comment. I thought that was an, an excellent uh, discussion. And there uh, are no little people. The, the, you're the people who can make this happen. Uh, we're doing the study right now. And the fact that this was authorized in legislation passed by both chambers, uh, the legislature indicates that, that the legislature is serious in looking at this. And once we look at it, and if it, it makes sense, and that's what these listening sessions and the other work we're doing will tell us, then the next step uh, will be to introduce some legislation to do it. But for that to happen, every one of you, and I, there are something like 100 people on the call, you know, you talk to your legislators, make yourselves heard, and that will make a difference in moving this forward, assuming that, you know, the results of, of what we do here says that this is the right thing to do. So thank you for those comments, and I think they're great. Uh, th thank, thank you, you. Senator. Yeah. And to Gregory. Um, we'll go next to uh, Joshua, and then uh, I understand, uh, John Meyer, that you're having a, a trouble raising your hand, so we'll go to you, go to you after Joshua. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Heather. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Joshua Sherman. I'm the CEO of Old Mill Road Media, publisher of Vermont Magazine, Stratton Magazine, the Vermont News Guide, and founder of Old Mill Road Recording here in East Arlington, Vermont. Um, thank you for allowing me to share some thoughts. I had uh, emailed with uh, Commissioner Pelham, and um, uh, some of my comments are actually in response to our last meeting, and I wanted to make sure that uh, I had the chance to share these uh, with the group, uh, including uh, Representative Jerome and uh, Senator Brock. Um, uh, Robert Frost, uh, the poet most closely associated with Vermont, was born in California. And in fact, Frost didn't move to Vermont until he was 44. And um, Norman Rockwell, the artist most closely associated with Vermont, was born in New York City in, in uh, 1894, and he moved to Vermont in 1939 at age 45. Um, and of note, when Rockwell moved to Vermont, he was already a huge celebrity, having been on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post for over two decades. It's important to acknowledge these iconic creatives because they serve as, as prime examples of artists who chose Vermont and in return helped the international distribution of the Vermont brand. Um, and uh, similarly, I moved to Vermont in 2009 and have not only personally invested heavily in rebuilding the infrastructure of the historic town of East Arlington, reinventing it as both an artist colony and state-of-the-art production facility with Old Mill Road recording, but have also worked tirelessly to promote all of the amazing work being done in Vermont by others via our five publications, including Vermont Magazine, which is in 50 states and five international countries, um, as well as two weekly radio shows on WEQX. Um, I've also so recruited other talents to join the team and move to Vermont, including Grammy award-winning engineer Ben Arendelle and Tony award winner Christian Hoff. 
And I share this to make a critical point, um, which uh, Tim Clark, uh, thank you for mentioning it, is that it's very dangerous to create any legislation or tax credits or incentives that are only available to quote unquote Vermonters, um, as was suggested by one of the speakers at the last Zoom meeting, to automatically assume that we are not in a position to recruit larger industry opportunities that would help with the international distribution of Vermont's brand is a bad idea. As, as uh, Tim spoke about, Buffalo and Niagara Falls, and as uh, uh, the commissioner from Rhode Island said, these there are major opportunities and Vermont has a great brand. When I go to New York City and people ask me where I live, nobody, and I tell them Vermont, nobody ever says, ugh, I hate Vermont. They always say, ah, oh, I love Vermont. People want to come to Vermont. So um, I, 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 I just wanted to put on the record that we should in no way limit ourselves by outsiderism and anti-Hollywood sentiment, which I know, Senator Brock, you addressed at the last meeting as well, saying that now more than ever, Vermont wants to bring people in. Um, in addition to long-term residents like Frost and Rockwell, Vermont also has a long history of outside creatives coming to Vermont, whether we look at Baby Boom or Beetlejuice, which were two enormously successful commercial films, both of which were filmed in Vermont in the 1980s and have served as postcards for the state. There are many other movies in which Vermont's setting is integral to the plot. Uh, a fun anecdote that I often quote is that back in 1955, film director Alfred Hitchcock worked in collaboration with the state government to actually film Shirley MacLaine's first film here, The Trouble with Harry, that was in and around Craftsbury, and the Hollywood, Hollywood scouts were eager to find new locations, and the state was hoping for a marketing boost. So this is not new, and the film highlighted the state's mountains and fall foliage, and they actually had their world premiere of the film here in Vermont, September 30th, 1955. Um, so as pointed out by Senator Brock, we want to avoid outsiderism and we want to create the opportunity to bring outside money in as tim clark so wisely said this is not vermont dollar circulating this is new money coming into our ecosystem um uh next um at Old Mill Road Recording, we've done pre-production and post-production work regularly. It's called ADR for the likes of Netflix, 20th Century Studios, The History Channel, Hallmark, and others. And whenever outside creatives see the studio, they often state, we'd love to film here. Does Vermont have any tax credits or incentives? And as Bill Stetson stated about the conversation with Steven Spielberg, when the answer is no, the conversation is over. Um, so I know we're all saying the same thing, but it cannot be emphasized enough. Um, and as, as, as Tim said, aren't we tired of seeing Vermont filmed in Vancouver or in his example, uh, Buffalo, Niagara? Um, uh, so one of the other things to remember is that Southern Vermont is so close to the border of New York's capital region, Hudson Valley and the Berkshires. So we are leaving money on the table. Um, at the last Zoom meeting, many other key points were made and some reiterated today. The dire need for uh, media commission serving as both recruitment and retention organization, as well as a resource for media makers, a centralized database for media production, access to broadband at rural locations, and of course, tax credits. There's no need to go into those, but I do think that there's one argument regarding tax credits and incentives that have has not exactly been made. We don't have to convince, but Tim mentioned it earlier in terms of historical credits, uh, historical villages. Um, Vermont already has tax credits and incentives. We don't have to convince Vermont that it's a good idea to have them. We have to convince Vermont that this is a worthy cause. And so the same way that Vermont has invested in its historic downtowns, there needs to be an understanding that this is an opportunity, not just for outside economic development and, and dollars, but that we that this is a worthy industry. And in order to do that, we need our rep representatives to fully understand what we do. Most people don't understand what it takes to make a film or a TV series or a radio show or a magazine for that matter. And if we want the Vermont government to support what we do, I believe it's key that we help them understand the wide range of opportunities that exist in the industry. Um, so since the governor and legislature are already in a 
agreement on the dire need for youth retention and trade training, why not showcase the fact that the film, TV, and media industry are excellent opportunities for youth retention, recruitment, and trade training? Um, the ROI has already been addressed, so thank you once again to the two film commissioners, but um, I want to thank you for your time and attention, but I wanted to make sure to, to put it out there that we need to make sure we're making the right argument, and we need to make sure that our representatives actually understand what the film industry, uh, uh, who benefits from the media industry in terms of the workers and what we do. Thank you. Did we lose Heather? Oh, we lost Heather. Okay, I'm jumping in here. Thank you, Joshua, very much. Um, our final speaker is Scott Finn. I know we have a lot of hands up, but I wanted to give Scott Finn, who is CEO of Vermont Public, time to chime in with a perspective from the, pub, the world of public media. And Scott, we'd love to hear your thoughts on how public media might be engaged in this conversation. And then hopefully we'll have time to circle back to some of the hands that I see up in the crowd. Scott, welcome. Thank you, Karen. And I appreciate being invited to be part of this. Um, at Vermont Public, our mission is to engage a broader, more diverse community through stories that bring people together. And some of those stories are stories that we make. We have more than 100 employees, including 30 people that make stories in one way or another, the reporters and producers and other storytellers, and then all the other support people that make their stories possible and get them to people. Um, I also want to give a shout out to a couple other groups that we work with a lot. Uh, today is Community Media Day in Vermont, and it's amazing that Vermont has 24 community media centers that do incredible work at the ground grassroots, um, both sort of training the next generation of filmmakers and supporting the ones that are already here. So let's, let's not forget about them in this conversation either. Um, and then we, we, you know, we work with some in, wonderful independent producers. Best O'Brien, I'm seeing you in the chat. Um, we worked with you a lot. And also, um, I want to give a shout out to Erica Heilman, who doesn't do film, but does podcasting. And Rumble Strip just won a National Peabody Award, which many of you know is, is one of the highest um, uh, awards you can receive for people that produce stuff that we produce. So we're really proud to be affiliated with them. Um, and also, I want to give a shout out to Eric Ford, who's on the call who works for Vermont Public and is behind the Bait Gear show and fun, which we're gonna talk about. Um, for the last six years, Vermont Public has supported independent documentary filmmakers through distribution, promotion, and funding as part of our series Made Here. Um, we've also supported independent podcasters like Erica Heilman as well. We've heard from filmmakers that we talked to that there are two huge challenges in a rural state like Vermont, and one of them, is just a sense of connection, community, uh, ability to, to basically connect both for companionship, but also to find resources and work. The other issue is money, plain and simple. Enough money to be able to live to a decent standard of living in a state that is not inexpensive. Um, Vermont Public in the last year has stepped up and is trying to help address the funding issue with the launch of the Made Here Fund. Our donors have given us almost $100,000 to support independent filmmakers and storytellers um, that are especially people that are um, under 30 outside of Chittenden County and who represent the Bontoc community, uh, attempting to, to support diverse um, makers throughout the state. Uh, and when it comes to the connection part, I wanna also give a shout out to Chad Urban and Lucas Huffman, who are with the Vermont Production Collective. We've worked with them at Made Here for the Made Here Festival and uh, they're doing amazing work to address the need of community and connection. Um, so there's there's a lot of work being done, but the state's in need of a really solid hub and spoke model for content creators. That includes Vermont Public, the collective, and all sorts of others with similar goals. Um, a state-funded film and media office could help be that convener. Uh, we've had um, a lot of discussions here tonight about big funding and films with names that we all understand. Public media is more in um, the business of telling the smaller stories at the community level that are uh, may not reach around the world. Sometimes they do. More often, they affect us here. 
And, you know, there are lots of people in Vermont, an amazing number of people that are telling great stories on a shoestring and with limited support. And, um, you know, the idea of having the state become a more active partner uh, is really exciting. You know, Vermont public wants to continue to do what we can to participate in that and help to create and distribute all of this great work. Thank you, Scott. And I'm not sure, can folks hear me again? <laughs> Sorry about that. I screen went blank, crashed. You know, we got to roll with these things. So my apologies for, for missing part of the conversation. And I'm so glad this is being recorded so I can go back and watch the tape. <laughs> um, I, I see that we are coming close to the end of our time here, but I know that there's folks who haven't had a chance uh, to chime in yet. So if folks are willing to stay on for a few more minutes, I would love to uh, hear what Seth and Hugo have to say. And, and forgive me, I'm not sure if John got a chance to speak um, before I lost you folks. He did not. Okay, so um, why don't we why don't we go with Seth and then we'll go back to John. I'm not sure who was first, and, and Hugo. Then we'll we'll finish up with you if, if that's okay. If folks have to drop off, um, understand that. And again, Scott, apologies I didn't get a chance to do your intro, but I know you were in good hands. <laughs> Hi there. Um, thank you so much for hosting this and thank you for providing a space for uh, us to talk. Um, my name is Seth. I'm a director of photography who moved from North Carolina uh, in 2020, um, seeking a, a nice place to live and a beautiful place to live, um, but also already in the back of my head knowing I would probably have to move uh, for career sake. Um, after being here a couple of years, I have finally started to find a little bit of a space, but that ends up being uh, a combination of doing the small commercial jobs in that, that are in the area and a lot of wedding films, which actually pays more than uh, any of the film industry um, in the state. I'm about to start principal photography on a low budget feature film in the area. Um, and a few of the things, basically what I wanted to just say is and go over uh, for for this is just some emphasis on some things that we've already talked about. Um, one is difficulty in in trying to source anything for film. Um, I mean, right now I need to find uh, a few uh, professional light stands, and there's only one grip department that you can rent from in the state, and then the rest is. Uh, stuff you have to find from friends or stuff like that. And the business is just not here. And if if the one business uh, is doing any commercial, all the equipment is used. So there's a huge lack of that in the state. Um, but also there's, if a business was to start, there's no, uh, there's nothing shooting here to support that as well. So there's a, a dichotomy there. Um, I, at this point, am, am still trying to decide if I want to move to New York and, or stay in Vermont. And so this is extremely helpful to hear that there are a lot of people who are in the same boat, who are trying to eke out a living, doing anything they can. Um, to be honest, like in Vermont, I'm a director of photography. In somewhere like uh, New York, I would be more of like an assistant camera operator um, because Vermont is such a small production. So a couple of things I wanted to bring up are that uh, uh, very helpful things that were already brought up. Um, uh, other films coming here with an attitude of Vermont has a small film community. There's a lot of people who wanna do good work, but they need to learn. That's huge, that's a huge help. Um, and also there's so many creatives here who are also trying to decide, do I stay or do I go and can, we, um, and, and funding for those people to create their stuff at a lower budget level to learn and gain experience is also as important as productions coming into the state um, uh, to gain experience. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I've run out of what I wanted to say, so. <laughs> no, your comments are much appreciated. Thank you, Seth. Um, John, go ahead. I understand you were had some things thank to you. add. Um, happy to be here. Uh, thank you for doing this. Um, I'm John Meyer. 
from Norwich, Vermont, and I just um, bought a place in Putney and uh, I'm in the process coming down the home stretch on developing a venue here, a 3,000 square foot venue. Uh, I know that uh, Representative Jerome there mentioned that um, Vermont is looking for venues. Um, also, um, my film and media experiences in, um, in uh, 2000, I led a small team that um, won the Oscar for the short documentary and I've done a number of uh, video and, and TV work um, that's been shown internationally. Uh, so I'm willing to help. Um, I've raised money for projects uh, and helped administer with projects. And now I've got a venue to help. So I just wanted you folks to know that um, I'm here and we're working at it. Thank you. That's great. Very exciting. Thank you, John. Um, and Hugo, thank you for being so patient. Thank you everyone for being patient. Sorry, I need to tell him mute. Um, <laughs> thank you, and I know that we're short on time, so I'll be brief. Um, I just wanted to thank you all, and I know it's a listening session, so I wanted to make sure that we all had a chance to support the work that you're doing. I think it's, it's necessary and wonderful. Um, it's a great group you put together. Um, uh, I've done a lot of research on the Lumiere factory in Burlington. Um, and I'm an engineer and uh, also do a bunch of different art projects. But uh, the thing I wanted to share in the little time that we have is that um, responding to a bit of what uh, has been said um, and one thought from Joshua, uh, I would add the Lumiere brothers as uh, some of those artists that have been in Vermont. And um, to be able to say that the uh, uh, creators of cinema and creators of color photography and perfectors of black and white photography and x-ray um, built the only factory outside of France in Vermont is something that we only Vermont can say. And we, we have something to build on that responds to the French working people of Vermont that were one of the principal reasons for the factory being here. We have a very powerful story that we can claim as the origin of our commitment to this process. And I, I, I wanna share it with you all. The link is there on the Vermont history article but there's a lot more than that. And um, I think uh, it, it's, it has merit for the state to support this effort. And we have a, an identity that uh, we need to embrace and support. Thank you. Thank you, Hugo. Um, it's, we are at time, so I'm, I'm going to cut it off here unless uh, Senator Brock or Representative Jerome, if you had any final words to say. I, I did want to thank our guest, uh, Tim Clark, Scott Finn, Dr. Williams. Um, I think both Dr. Williams and uh, Stephen Piper had to leave already, but we really do appreciate it. And truly to everybody who has provided comments, um, both through these listening sessions and um, you know, folks who have, have reached out to us otherwise. It's, it's critically important for the, for this task force to really hear as much as we possibly can hear, which is exactly why we're holding these sessions. So, um, Representative Barack, Representative Joan, or... <laughs> just go ahead. I'm, ha I'm happy to go first. I, I just want to thank everybody. I think this was, uh, in, it's interesting to see the two conversations. Um, and this one was very different from from our first listening session and brought up a lot of really interesting um, points, not only in our discussions, but also I really appreciate the chat. And I think there was a, a lot of really good solid information given in that too. So thank you so much for your information. Um, and I hope we can call on some of you to provide some more information as we go down the road and um, develop our report. So thank you, thanks again. And I appreciate your time and your insight and your, your expertise. Rock, I'd like to join in and thank all of you for uh, joining us and for everything you've done and for the great information that you've given us. I know 
there are a number of hands up that perhaps didn't get uh, recognized because of the time constraints. But I hope you'll take a, a moment, if you do have other thoughts or ideas, to jot them down and send them in to uh, the Film Commission, or uh, for that matter, pick up the telephone. My telephone number and that of Representative Jerome's is on the legislative website, and I'm sure we'd be happy to hear from you directly. So uh, don't stand on ceremony. Uh, if you have something that you think we really need to know to do this right, please pick up the phone and call us. Thanks so much again. I, sec I second that. I uh, really value having a conversation, so please feel free to reach out to us. Can't think of a better note to leave it on than that, that we know we really do want to know. So thank you again for everybody's time. Um, our work, I would say, is really just beginning here. So stay in touch. Uh, thank you for everything you do to support the film and media industry in Vermont. And we'll see you all soon. Good thank luck you. to you all. So long. Thank you.